Welcome back to Sledgehammer Horror, guys. I am Ken Sledge, and let's talk horror. Today, I am joined by the amazing actor and sometimes his own stunt man, Chris Warder. Chris, how are you doing, man? I'm doing good. As uh, we said earlier, it's better to be above ground than below it, right? <laughs> yes, sir, my friend. Uh, so you guys may know Chris from a wide variety. He's not just in horror films. He was in the newly released uh, Willie's Wonderland, which is awesome. But he's also been in a lot of movies that mean a lot to me that are not in the horror genre, such as Sin City, Machete, uh, Harold and Kumar Escape from Guantanamo Bay, No Country for Old Men, and one of my personal favorites, Idiocracy, and so much more, man. So, Chris, how are you doing, man? It's really awesome to have you here. Yeah, I'm doing good, man. Uh, as far as uh, the world's concerned, the way I try to look at it is try, try not to make the, the world's 2020 and 2021 my 20, 2021. Uh Right now, I'm just uh, kind of riding the wave of Willie's and getting kind of on the bandwagon. It seems like uh, the the audience is liking it, which is which is a real good thing. You know, uh, we literally wrapped the movie. I think the day, the last day we shot, was kind of the day or the day after when pretty much the the country shut down or the world shut down. So we just scooted in there with getting it done, uh, and of course being able to do post as we can. Um, you know, and it, and it not being able to release when we wanted to in Halloween was kind of a bummer, but uh, because of the time uh, of the, of the time it was shot to the time it was released, it's really cool to see, especially with the way it's, it wasn't in theaters like it should have been as well, how, how the audience has embraced it. You know, um, I know Nick takes a lot of crap, crap for, for some stuff lately, but this just seemed to be, you know, right up his alley, right in his, his lane. And, um, I'm really happy to tell you the truth that that the, the fans are enjoying what you know what we put out there. So, yeah, man. And I got to tell you, because I just had Kevin Lewis on here as well. I was lucky enough to be able to sit and have a conversation with him. And man, this is such a fun movie from beginning to end. You are having fun, and for fucking weeks after I watched this movie, man, I've been singing "It's Your Birthday," <laughs> and like this is it will not leave my head. It's earwigged its way in there, man. And it's one of those films that. You can have so much fun with this movie. You can be scared, but there's comedy aspects to this movie as well. There are definitely moments of levity where you can have fun with it. You can be scared. We watched it at our house. Unfortunately, we weren't able to go see it in the cinema, but I very much enjoyed it. And I'm looking forward to getting my Blu-ray copy so that way I can watch some of the behind the scene features and learn more about the film. So what was it like filming this? Dude, uh, so I have to start out mentioning Kevin. Kevin is 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 ridiculous. And, and what I mean by that from an actor's perspective is uh, I, I'm an actor who likes to play in the whole sandbox if he's allowed to, or the dog off the chain. And Kevin was just that. He allowed me uh, to embrace and embody that character of Jed Love like I really wanted to. I mean, he, he really had no, uh, I want to say restraints, but he really allowed me to, to see the character like I saw it. And we really connected on how we both saw it. So I got to play in the entire sandbox. And man, that's I, I, it seems like it, it did show on film that I was having a bunch of fun playing that character. And actually, everybody else was, too, because Kevin allowed us to be free as actors. And you always want to work harder for an actor's director, a guy that will let you, like you said, let you take the reins. This is your character. You know, it was. it's kind of I'm directing you, but this is your character. I want you to make it your own. So to have a director that's really an actor's director, I, again, I've never been on set, so I can't speak from experience from just from what I would expect. I would expect that you would want to work harder for a guy like that because he's really letting you do what you got to do and do it the best that you can do. So in my opinion, I'd want to work harder for a director like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You want to be an overachiever for a guy who's willing to uh, to take it. I don't say take a chance, but just will, allowing to you to use all the tools in your tool belt. And you're like, well, hell, dude, I'm going to build you a fucking mansion. Watch mm -hmm. this. <laughs> well, that's the thing. You know, you scratch my back. I scratch yours. If he's letting you take the reins, obviously, you're not going to do a shitty job because it's still you. You know, it's still coming back on you. So when you're taking the range, you're obviously doing what you think is best for the character and best for the film. That's going to be the best overall. That's what we all want in the end. Oh yeah, absolutely. And and what's really cool at the end of the day is is what what's showing on film is what what I experience as an actor. A lot of times you get where you know you do get a chance to see maybe playback or the, you know some of the dailies if you're lucky enough to be in you know uh, you know Val uh, video village there and kind of somebody's gonna play some of the back, especially in the digital age. But what's really cool is when you're 
if you don't get a chance to do that, but you're not, you feel like you're knocking it out of the park and you see it and you're like, okay, man, what I did is what I see. And that's, that's a good, that's a good day. You know what I mean? So yeah. Yeah. A lot of fun, man. A lot of fun. Oh, and that's, that's the best way to describe this movie. If I had to describe this movie in one word, it would be fun because that's what we had. We had a blast watching this movie. I mean, whether it's uh, Nicholas Cage playing pinball or the deaths in the movie. I'm not going to spoil anything because the movie's still right. very fresh. So I don't want to spoil anything. Sure. Um, some of the kills in the movie or, oh my God, that thing's watching. Well, let's give it a show. You know, no matter what, it was a fun movie to watch. And there were so many fun moments in this film. Um, I know that things are kind of crazy right now, but do you got anything in the pipeline coming up in the future that you can tell us about? Or are you kind of laying low for a little bit? Um, what I've really been working on lately, uh, um, I have a possible partner in a, in a TV show that's coming up, but I can't mention anything on it, unfortunately, that the NDAs and stuff. But uh, what I've really been digging in during COVID is my writing. I'm a writer as well. And uh, I've been pitching a, uh, a TV pilot right now. And I've got a, a couple other feature scripts that I've been pitching to executives oh, really hard over the last three or four months. And, uh, and it's getting some traction. So I'm hoping that when production starts to pick up, that the interest in the the uh, either the film or the pilot, one of the films or the pilot, uh, starts to get a little more traction toward it. So, yeah, in the last year of the COVID, because we haven't had production, production has picked it back up here after the first year in Hollywood. We got a lot of COVID restrictions, and everybody seems to be following them. There's a few base camps I've seen around town, um, and, and auditions have started to pick up for me as well. But what I've really concentrated on the back on the pretty much the entire year of 2020 is uh, is, is my writing most mostly, yeah. So uh, I've got a, a pilot right now that's more of a uh, kind of a, a, a paying homage to Rambo. Okay. Going back old school. And then uh, I have a feature that kind of pays homage to Rocky. I'm a huge right. Stallone fan. And uh, both of those guys are kind of, both of those characters are kind of upgraded for the modern age. And, mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I was raised an army brat. I was raised in the heart of Texas. I played Texas high school football and, you know, having buddies like that, even my age, knowing that there's an audience that's kind of aching for that. So when I pitch these to my friends a lot, they're like, dude, I watched that yesterday. Let's just make it. I'm like, all right, dude, I'm working on it. So, uh, right. so I'm hoping that one of those, you know, both of those get some traction soon. And uh, to be honest with you, the uh, uh, the, the sniper one, the, the Rambo-esque is, is kind of something I wrote as a vehicle for myself. So um, so that's what we're, we're working on currently. Man, I can't wait. I was looking. I, I was looking down here in my drawers. I have a, a shirt. It's just a blue shirt. It says "Win Rocky Win." It's the shirt that he wore <laughs> in the movie. I'm right. a huge Rocky fan. Grew up watching yeah. all the Rockies. It's something I'm really into. Sly Stallone is one of those guys that there's a lot of actors you look at. And you see him as a certain role. You know, like whenever. And there's nothing against any actors, but when I see John Heater, I see Napoleon Dynamite. You know, when I see Macaulay Culkin, no matter what, I see the kid from Home Alone, Kevin McAllister. You know, but when I see Sylvester Stallone, I can see Rambo. I can see Rocky. And there's so many different aspects. The, the cat from Cliffhanger. You know, that was one of the craziest movies I ever seen when I was a kid. When that woman dropped, I was like, oh, my God. You know, like, so Sylvester Stallone is one of those guys that I can see him in so many different roles because he impacted me so much as a kid. And it's nice to see that he had that type of impact on you as well. Oh, absolutely. I got my Rocky poster hanging right here to the left of me as inspiration. But uh, what, what really impresses me about Stallone, man, and, and this is, um, this takes nothing from him. I'm a huge Sylvester Stallone fan, but, you know, if anybody started out with the world against him, I mean, you know, he's, you know, the way he talks and some of the way he looks a little bit uh, and maybe, maybe even his height a little bit, he, he was already starting out with two and three things against him with Rocky. And we most, most of us who are Rocky fans know the Rocky story and how hard it was for him to get Rocky made and for him to play Rocky. And, you know, it's so funny when I tell people, you know, this is, this is my Rocky, this, this, this story I have. And people are so fucking flippant nowadays, man. And it makes me, it used to make me angry. It just makes me laugh now. They're like, Oh, you think you can do that shit? Or you think that you think that you know, everybody's got their Rocky. I'm like, well, Here's my thing. If, if you didn't have your Rocky, and especially if you're creative, uh, you're probably going to go home pretty quick because you've got to have that, that heart of hope somewhere to uh, drive you to, to try to make this, this whole thing that is Hollywood happen. So I would never, somebody told me they had a Rocky in their heart or the Rocky, they'd put pen to paper and made their Rocky. Well, fucking A, man, keep making it. Keep doing it. Everybody know? has the magnum opus that they want to make, man. 
Like that, like you said, if you don't have a, that big thing that you're chasing, what the hell are you doing? We have mm-hmm. maybe a hundred years here and then we're gone. So why would you not spend the time that you have here trying to get everything that you want? Like that, 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 that blows my mind. Like, yeah, I have this thing that I created that I'm super fucking proud of. Why, why you gotta be so cynical towards me? Like, this is gonna do it, man. Like, I get exactly what you're saying, man. So, yeah. Chris, we talked about what you got coming up in the future, and uh, please give me updates about that. So, I know with NDAs yeah. and stuff, it can get really tricky. But you guys don't have to wait for my updates. I have Chris's links down here for all his social media. Make sure you're giving him a follow so you can track all the stuff that he's doing. Uh, we know about right now. You got the Willie's Wonderland. You're kind of riding the wave of that. But now, my friend, I want to go back to the past. And I want to talk about the first horror movie you ever watched. What got you started in the horror genre. And your first horror movie was? Phantasm. And I am so excited because it's the first time I've got to talk about this movie on here. And I absolutely love this movie. Um, do you remember how old you were the first time you seen it? I think I was seven. Seven years old, yeah. And I saw it, I think, on uh, like HBO. I didn't see it at the theater. I saw it on like eight. The, the early days of HBO right. uh, with some, I used to hang out when I was younger. My, my friends were actually quite a bit older than me. So I probably got in more trouble than I should have. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I probably should have been watching it, but man, I, I, I couldn't sit here and tell you because it was the first one I ever saw and I never watched it again. But uh, there's, there's several things about that movie, man, that just stick with me. I mean, uh, the other tall man and the fucking spear. I don't know why, but the first time he ever let that thing loose, I was like, what the fuck, man? I, right. it scared me. I mean, it scared me to death because I was like, how's this dude controlling? A seven-year-old mind. How's this dude controlling this thing and killing people? Um, right. So, yeah, it was uh, – it, it got in my DNA a little bit about scaring me. I'm not, I don't I'm, – I, I watch any horror movie you got out there. It doesn't, like, scare me or make me have nightmares necessarily, but – but, yeah, that one sticks with me for whatever reason. Um, probably, again, because it's the first. And not only that, but, man, what the fuck is that movie about? Like, people ask me, like, what's Phantasm about? I'm like, um, a guy that's a funeral home director, and, and he's fucking crazy. Like, I don't know what you want. Yeah, and, and he carries this thing, and he, he sees somebody wants to kill, he sends it on its way, and yeah. that's it. I, 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 I can tell you either. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so we kind of alluded to it a little bit, but let's talk, let's really get to the part of this. Which scene was it that affected you the most? You know, again, not being able to see it in a long time, but it seems to me, and I get this wrong, I apologize to the true dedicated fans of this, but it seems to me the first time the tall man appears, it seems like he's at the long end of a corridor, like any fucking scary movie, right? And mm-hmm. he lets the spear loose. I, I cannot... I can't elaborate on that, but that is the one scene that the first time you see him and the first time he lets that loose that sticks with me most. It, it's it you know you know who's in control of the movie from that moment on. It doesn't matter. It's it's like when Jason chases fucking people. No matter how yeah, fast yeah. you run, he's catching you. No matter what room you're in in that fucking you know in that <laughs> house or that that, that that facility they're in, he's going to find you. And so is the sphere. So you can run all you want. And you see the kid, like he turns around and he sees the spear for the first time and he runs and he dives down and, you know, you see the spear just go over top of him. And it's such a creepy scene, man. Um, So, and I I know you said it's hard, but um, when you, obviously the first thing that pops in your head and when you think of this movie, I would have to guess would be the tall man and the spear, because that's the answer I, I would say for me personally, but when you get that first kill, because we're talking about which kill affected you the most, you're talking about that first kill when you have the spear and it goes into the guy's head. Yep, yep. And then it starts, the blood starts spurting right, out the right. back of the spear. For a seven year old, that had to be so scarring, man. Yeah. It's like, so it gets a hold of him and you think, okay, he's just dead. But then it starts to work on him. As you said, the blood starts to spurt out the back of the spear. And it's obviously got to be doing some kind of drilling motion or whatever it may be. And the person is still alive. It's not like he's dead and this is happening. This shit's happening while he's still alive. So you can only imagine what kind of pain he's <laughs> taking with him on his way to death. So, yeah, it, uh, as you said, as a kid, you, 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 you've never seen anything like that. So the first impression that it makes is a deep and a, and a, and a, and a uh, lasting one, so to speak. So, yeah, I, you know what? <laughs> I'm not saying I'm a conspiracy theorist, but talk about if So if we switch it from when I was seven to AI in the future or even AI now, um, that's the spooky shit, man. I mean, 
you go from there to the Terminator uh, and mm-hmm. the machines are making the calls now. So it's like, whoa. Um, yeah, it, <laughs> it kind of fucks with your mind a little bit. Right. And the tall man in this movie, one scene that always affected me was when you first, when the tall man and the kid see each other and they're each on each end of the corridor and the room that, to exit is in the middle. So they start inching their way towards each other. And then the kid takes off running and you see the tall man chasing him. Like that scene to me always fucked with me. Cause you got this dude just chasing after this little kid. And that scene always scared the shit out of me. So uh, we talked about phantasm a little bit here, Chris, but now I want to go scream on you here for a second. What's your favorite scary movie? What is your favorite horror movie of all time? We know your first, but I want to get to your favorite for a little bit. Oh man. That's a, that's a good one. Uh, and, and I'm embarrassed to admit this, but uh, you know, horror not being my my necessarily first genre. Um, what was my my favorite scary movie is? Um, hmm. Wow! Can we loop back around to that one? <laughs> yeah. See, and it's funny because when I send these questions off to people, and I don't know if people believe me or not, but I never include that question. Because I want a genuine answer when we get sure. to that one. So sure. we'll, we'll do our skull count real quick, and then we'll go back to your favorite horror movie. Okay. Now, okay. I got one generating, I think, but let me give it some thought, though, before I commit. <laughs> okay. Well, let's let's do our skull count real quick. Phantasm. I know you said you only watched it the one time, but what we're going to do is we're going to rank that on a skull count. Zero being the worst, five being the best. So we're not ranking it. We're not being critics. We're not ranking it on acting and production and all that. We're ranking it on how this film affected you the first time you've seen it. So zero to five skulls, what would your ranking be of Phantasm? I give it a solid four, man. Uh-huh. A solid four, yeah. It uh, it left its mark, however it left it. it. It was a solid four for me. I mean, uh, to be seven years old and to think back at all the movies I've ever watched and that one come out, uh, yeah. come out of me at, when, you, when you sent the question in, yeah, I'd have to give it at least a solid four. Yeah. And go, going from Thundercats mm-hmm. to Phantasm is right. such a big jump in a child's yeah. mind. You know what I mean? Like, that's how I think of it. Like, you watch an episode of Rugrats and then yeah. you go and you watch Phantasm. I mean, the movie starts with a couple having sex in a graveyard yeah. and then the girl stabs and kills the guy and turns into the tall man. And you're just like, what the fuck just happened? Like, even as a little kid, you're like, that was a girl and now it's an old dude that's huge you know yeah. like so this movie definitely does absolutely have an effect and it's one of the movies that I, I am kind of upset with how they continued this on because much like jaws the ring this is a movie that didn't need to be franchised this is a movie that would have been a perfect standalone movie you didn't need jaws two three the revenge you didn't need the ring two and three you didn't need phantasm two through four these were the perfect standalone films that you did not have to use any towards the future. And it's cut. And... Still, Phantasm 1 is a movie that I think will always live in infamy for me because just because of the tall man and that sphere. You know, my, my grandpa, I wish I still had it, man. But when I was young, my grandpa made me a little copy of that sphere. And we would, you know, act like we were throwing it around the house and stuff. I, I would do anything to have that back. But I never got to watch all of phantasm because as a kid and i hate to admit this now but i always thought it was kind of boring you had the cool kills but there's a lot of stuff that as a child you don't understand that's going on in this movie so it's one of those movies that to me was just like it's cool when you watch the ball hit the guy and he falls now when i was young i thought it was funny because the guy pissed himself but i didn't realize that when you die that's what happens you know what i mean like i didn't realize that right Um, let's circle back here for a minute before i let you go i want to talk about if, if you can your favorite horror movie? You know, as, as you were talking the last few minutes, I've got two. I've got two. It's going to be a tie, probably. And probably my favorite, just, whoa, what the fuck scared the shit out of me, is going to be a classic. It's Nightmare on Elm Street, dude. For a dude to wake you the fuck up and control you like a fucking puppet is some scary shit. And holding, his, said- hand, holding his hand going down the street is the girl from R- The Ring, man. That, yeah. That's a spooky fucking movie, too. That, that uh, I, even as an adult, I'm like, nah, I'm good. You know, I, I, got, I got the first one out. Uh, I ain't got to worry about seeing her again. <laughs> but well, no, see, probably, I said, go, go ahead. ahead. No, just probably my first, my favorite. 
what what kind of resonates with me most, and, I, and most of that stuff does come from your childhood, is is uh, you know Freddy Krueger and, and Nightmare on Elm Street. Man, it's just woo blows me. Yeah, right there he is. <laughs> you know, I mean, I've I've said numerous times, there's no such thing as a perfect film. It doesn't exist. But to me, the only horror film that's come very close was A Nightmare on Elm Street. If you take out the last five minutes of that movie where, you know, you got the blow up doll coming through the window and that dumb fucking Freddy car. I hate that fucking stupid car. Like if you take that out of there, that to me is the perfect horror movie. It's low budget. The, the practical effects are absolutely great. The idea of Freddy Krueger is terrifying. The kids are, you know, I hate to show my age here, but those kids are hip in the movie. You know, you got some nice, cool, hip kids. You only have really three kills in that movie. And if you don't count the mom's fire death, you know, you got Rod in the jail cell. You got mm-hmm. Tina going up the wall. You got Johnny Depp in the waterbed. Those are all iconic, amazing kills. And to me, I can totally agree with you. I think A Nightmare on Elm Street is the best horror film ever made. It may not be my favorite, but I will die on the hill that A Nightmare on Elm Street is the best horror film ever made. It's solid, man. It, it is yeah. really solid. I agree with you on that. And uh, and you're right. It's going to one of those movies, too, that can be left alone. But of course, you know, if, when movies make money in Hollywood, guess what? Another one's going to be made. <laughs> you're going to beat that horse, man. You're going to beat it to death and then more. Yeah. <laughs> well, Chris, don't go anywhere, man. I got a couple more questions for you and a couple offers for you. Everybody sure. else, please, like I said before, make sure you're following Chris on social media. I've had the pleasure of talking to this guy a little bit, even before the podcast, and he's become a friend of mine. I very much enjoy our conversation. So make sure you're giving him a follow so you can stay up to date on the things he has coming up in the future. You'd want to be the first to know about all the things he has going on. So as always, everybody, I'm Ken Sledge. Stay what you are. Keep talking horror. And we'll see you guys soon.